Hey, y'all. Welcome back to Mountain Murders. This is our end of the week. <laughs> We're just going to start calling it this week. Yeah. Mountain we'll, Murders this week. You're lucky if you get an episode this week, Mountain Murders. <laughs> I'm Heather. And I'm Dylan. <laughs> you know, Dylan, I really thought once you were finished with shift work, we would have the time to devote solely to podcasting. And that has not been the case. Ha ha. <laughs> Surprise. The joke's on you, Heather. The plot twist. No, but here we are. We're trudging along. And as soon as we, you know, shake off the societal constraints and, and, and are flowing on the wind, I believe we're all we're going to do is podcast. Yeah. I, well, that is my hope. And we have started packing up our house. I know folks are curious when we will begin our Mountain Murders True Crime tour. <laughs> when we take Lucy the ambulance on the road, we'll be documenting, of course, our life on the road, as well as podcasting, doing a little bit of morbid tourism. I think people want us to leave because everybody I see is like, are you still here? Yeah, everybody's like, oh, you're still here. Oh, people yeah. don't think we're leaving. By God, we are. But when we are, I ain't looking back, bro. I'm not even going to, I'm going to remove all my rear view mirrors on before I leave. So I don't even see this place in yeah. my rear view. You know that backup camera I ordered? Yeah. We're not even going to use that. Not until we get out <laughs> of the state. Dylan, it's been a rough couple of weeks. I have to admit, I know we've got listeners out there who are like family and, and like to know how we're doing. And I have to say it's been a rough couple of weeks, but I'm trying to get it together. How about you? It's been a lot uh, dealing with uh, my daughter and my granddaughters. Their situation and issues has been a lot, and uh, that's oh, yeah, just... they've been living with us. I, people who listen regularly probably know that. Uh, yes, uh, my daughter and my two granddaughters, a four-year-old and a five-month-old. So, I mean, need I say more? Yeah. Yeah, we've been extra busy, extra stressed. So here we are in our happy place. In our happy place in the studio, ready to ready talk. Ready to talk true crime. I already started. Dylan, we have neglected our news recap the whole month of October because we've dedicated the show to ghosts and murder houses and all the creepy things. It is time to get back to talking true crime. Okay, let's dive in. I have somewhat of a local story to get us off, <laughs> to get us off, Whoa. to begin with, to kick off the show, Dylan. This is out of Oconee, South Carolina. South Carolina authorities have arrested a suspect after a car crash through the administrative gate at the Oconee Nuclear Station Thursday evening and reportedly tried to hit several security guards. Oh, my gosh. Now, this is scary stuff. Well, yeah, anytime you have a, a very high security site like a, a nuclear facility or any, you know, high tech lab like Oakley over there in, uh, in the Tennessee. You mean Oak Ridge? Oak Ridge, my fault. Um, these are not the types of places you want to go messing around. Officials say 66-year-old Doyle Wayne Wisenhunt of Arkansas is in jail and charged with attempted murder, malicious injury to personal property, and unlawful entry into an enclosed place after deputies say he accelerated his vehicle towards a security officer at the nuclear plant. Authorities say Wisenhunt caused damage to the gates and fencing outside of the secured area of the facility by striking them with his vehicle. They say Wisenhunt also trespassed onto the property of the nuclear station without authorization. Wisenhunt was also charged in a separate incident with one count of a hit and run after his vehicle was involved in a motor vehicle crash and he failed to remain at the scene. That wreck occurred on Friday um, in the Rochester Highway area. Wisenhunt was taken in custody at an abandoned home in the neighboring uh, Pickens County. Of course, the Oconee County Sheriff's Office is continuing its investigation, and they have not released further information uh, about maybe, like, this man's motives. Like, why was he trying to enter into this nuclear station? Well, yeah, he's lucky that they didn't light his punk ass up. You know what I mean? I mean, here you have a car crashing into things, trying to hit security personnel. I'm really surprised they did not open fire on him. It's uh, pretty frightening. I mean, anytime there's uh, anything relating to nuclear facilities, testing, I mean, that stuff just kind of weirds me out. Yeah, definitely. It take very much for it to go very, very wrong. Radiation is scary, y'all. It is. <laughs> it is. And, uh, of course, we grew up in a, in a time when it was like, oh, yeah, if a nuclear bomb hits, hide under your desk and put your hands over the back of your neck. 
I never <laughs> even cover a, your head. Even as a very uh, uh, rather young child, I always thought that was ridiculous. And what little bit I know I knew about or thought I knew about nuclear weapons, I did not imagine that was going to help a lot. And basically, they were telling you to put your head between your knees and kiss your ass goodbye. Exactly. Okay. Yes. yes. I have an interesting story here. So if uh, I think our listeners might remember a while back, companies that are typically not in the U.S. stopped producing or providing states, state municipalities, with the ingredients to perform lethal injections. Right. Because they, uh, a lot of these countries do not believe in capital pun- punishment. And therefore, they don't want to facilitate or help anyone, you know, kill, execute someone. So now, Alabama has become the first state to allow inmates to be executed with nitrogen gas. The state Supreme Court has ruled. Now, have you heard of that? This is the first I'm hearing of this method. I have not. This is news to me. You are educating me. Right now, Dylan. Oh, wow. Hit me with your best shot of information. So in a 6-2 decision, the Alabama Supreme Court has determined the method could be used and be tested out on inmate Kenneth Eugene Smith. Now, I'm not f- familiar with Mr. Smith's crimes. <clears throat> Kenneth Eugene Smith could likely become the first person executed by nitrogen hypoxia, an execution procedure never before tried. The state's all-Republican court voted 6-2 without comment Wednesday, granting Alabama Attorney General Steve Marshall's most recent request for Smith's execution warrant. Now, what are your feelings on this? Do you think that we should? I mean, I know we could talk for an hour about capital punishment. Is it good? Is I mean, it are bad? You, well, are you asking me what my... I guess the, the morality of the death penalty, if I uh, support it, if I'm pro or anti death penalty, is that what you're asking me or about this? <laughs> or are you asking me if this new method, if I have an opinion on the new method? Well, I guess I'm kind of asking you all that, but let's just stick with, do you think we need, a, if, okay. Now, nitrogen gas. Now that's not, I'm trying to remember, Think is that what they use at the uh, dentist office? Nitrous to laughing gas and such. As far as I know. So I, I'm assuming that they're going to give you such a, a large amount that they're going to drown out the oxygen and you're just going to die. Well, my feeling, you know, I think a lot of people know my feelings on it. If you committed the crime, and you're definitely guilty of some heinous heinous act, murder, whatever. Then I think you should die. And they they always seem to go, what kills me is they go out of their way to make it painless and, you know, just a, this great experience for the inmate. I'm just like, take them out back and put a damn $2 bullet in their head. Well, other states, including Oklahoma and Mississippi, have all authorized the use of nitrogen gas as an alternative method for execution. Yes. So it's not something that I guess is brand new. It is um, being used perhaps in other states. From what I understand, Dylan, just a quick uh, little search here because I don't know much about it. Um, they say it's not a painful execution. Yeah. And uh, as you said, multiple States have authorized the use, but no one's actually went through with the procedure. And yes, basically they're just going to uh, kill cut off your oxygen supply, fill sound. I don't know if it's a gas chamber. Uh, I'm thinking it's still just like your um, old Tommy gas chamber. They drop the pellets or whatever under you and, People get to watch the gas and encompass you, and then you suffocate to death. Yeah, and again, I have mixed feelings about the death penalty. I think there are some cases where absolutely fry them suckers, and then other cases, you know, if there's not strong evidence, we don't have strong forensic evidence. Um, Eyewitness testimony, which we know oftentimes is not quality. um, Then I do have strong feelings about executing possibly innocent people. Oh, yeah. And that's, that's the, not OK. No, that's not OK. And you have uh, issues, people with like cognitive issues or borderline as far as IQ goes. Did they truly know what was right and wrong? But, it, you know, that's I guess it sounds kind of goofy. But as long if I know definitely you did it, there's, you know, a whole lot of evidence, DNA, forensics that prove beyond the shadow of a doubt that you did indeed do this. Then I think you should not. I don't think you should get to live for years and years in prison. I agree, Dawn. 
Now, moving along, this isn't a crime story, but when I initially saw the headline, I thought to myself, wow, this is a stupid criminal. But then I've come to realize it's actually not a crime story, but it's still kind of an odd story we should discuss. There was a man trapped inside a steel-reinforced concrete jewelry vault in New York City overnight. Oh, my God. So I was thinking this is like a bank robber or like a jewel thief or something like that, right? But it turns out this guy was... Just trying to access his safe deposit box. Okay, and he got turned around and ended up locked in the vault. So the vault was on a timer, and it did open on its own Wednesday morning, but he was trapped overnight, and firefighters attempted to rescue him, but they had to abandon the rescue for safety reasons. I'm not sure exactly what those safety reasons are, but the fire department was called to the Midtown Manhattan building on Tuesday evening after the man became trapped while trying to access his safe deposit box. The building is located at 580 Fifth Avenue. It's known as the World Diamond Tower and houses several jewelry businesses. And this is another reason why I assumed this was a jewel thief. Right. See? Totally not correct. Um, They didn't explain exactly how he became trapped, but they were in communication with the man while he was inside the vault and they could watch him on a security camera. (laughs) So that's the part that's kind of weird to me as well. If I'm trapped in this horrible situation, can't get out of the vault, there's no bathroom facility, that kind of thing. I don't want somebody watching me. I might be over in the corner like peeing or something. So I'm going (laughs) to assume a lot of these big vaults are on this automatic timer. They cannot be opened by anyone. You have to wait till it opens itself back up. I guess that's supposed to be a a safety precaution against theft or someone forcing, you know, getting control of president of the bank or something like that and forcing him to open it. But uh, could you imagine this guy, this poor schlubs just in there trying to, you know, maybe get at some documents or move things around in and out of his safety deposit box. And you just hear click (laughs) a big, a big metallic click. And now you're stuck and there's nothing anyone can do about it. It's very scary. I would freak out. I do not want to be locked in a small confined space, a vault of any type. Even if I know there are rescuers there to help me, I would be freaking out. I'm like, can y'all get some pizza and beer in here through the like ducks or something? Now, Dylan, this is a story dated October 28th. But since we've had a bit of a hiatus from discussing the news that we like to get into i thought this was worthy of conversation a live cluster bomblet and ammunition was found in a donation drop-off at a thrift store in southeastern wisconsin oh my god i'm sorry janesville wisconsin an employee at the janesville goodwill made the discovery while conducting inventory on friday morning according to the janesville police department the store and surrounding area were evacuated as a bomb squad was called in to remove the small bomb and ammunition that is very scary so i'm going to assume some collector out there you know people will get um what they call it you know ordinances and collect them but they've been uh, demechanized or they've been made safe drilled out there's no gunpowder or whatever left in them and uh but someone actually got their hands on a real one janesville is about 76 miles southwest of milwaukee the bomblets if you're not familiar are part of cluster bombs which contain multiple explosive sub munitions Used during battle, the bombs can be dropped from planes or fired from the ground. And Janesville police are trying to determine who left the bomblet and ammunition at the Goodwill store. Luckily, employees quickly followed safety protocols by informing the store and donation center management and safety teams. They evacuated the building. They were able to, you know, move shoppers, donors, employees. Of course, they get the police department, emergency services out there. And the store and donation center resumed operations shortly after 1.30 p.m. on Friday. They are still trying to find the person who left this donation. And the next day, the cluster bomb was on the shelf with a $1,200 price tag on it. A special find. Yeah, special <laughs> find, exactly. Well, I'm going to assume it was some old-timers thing in in their belongings. Somewhat, maybe a vet, a war vet, who collected this along the way. And you know how it goes when the, the um, older men and women pass away. Sometimes the family just comes in there and clears all their stuff out, and they're just not, they're not even aware what's in their stuff. You know what I mean? And they just go to cleaning boxes out of the attic or whatever. And then, boom, next thing you know, you got a cluster bomb by the lamps in the Goodwill. That's very scary. So I've actually, when I was working in news, reported on two separate bomb 
types of situations. The first was this building that had been multiple businesses over the years. When I was in college, because I worked in my same town, you know, doing news uh, that I went to college, it had been an ice cream, a very popular ice cream shop, and it had been a couple of different little businesses over the years. And most recently, uh, now it's kind of like a produce stand and local market that sells local food items, kind of farmer's market store if that makes sense yeah the local market locally sourced goodness. well kind of in between businesses being there and new ownership someone had purchased the building and they were refabbing it and they found a bunch of old dynamite in the basement wow and they think it had been there for some years that is so unstable. Yes. Yes, it was very unstable. They had to call in a bomb squad. They like shut down the whole area because when I tried to get home later in the day, I had to go like kind of around and about to get to my apartment because traffic was all backed up because they were trying to deal with the situation. So it was like a really big deal in the town where I lived at the time. And then there was another incident where they found some old like bomb making items or something in the bottom of a lake. Oh my gosh. And then it was drained during the winter and they found these items. And of course that was a big deal to recover those. Man, the old sticks of dynamite, you can literally bump into it and set it off. Yes. And start sweating the nitroglycerin yes. out so of the it. The idea that this had possibly been there for some years yeah. was very, very frightening. People slamming around. Oh my gosh. I saw these magnet fishers. Fishermen, that's these, they throw these big magnets off bridges and drag whatever they catch metal yes. up. And, and they brought up a mess of ordinances. It turns out they were not that far down the road from a, a military shooting range of some sorts. And they would just kept finding, you know, unspent shells. A whole bunch of them laid them out and the cop comes. He's like, what in the world are you guys doing? They're like, oh, well, we found these in the river here. I mean, just... You know, after wars, that's another scary thing a lot of people don't think about is you have a lot of these depleted uranium shells or these unspent cartridges just laying around. You know, no one keeps up with that type of thing when you're in the midst of a battle and things like that. And then for years and years in Vietnam, um, places like Vietnam that people come upon these and sometimes they blow up minefields minefields kind of thing, yeah. mines really scare me. They they're very scary. The whole idea of Hiding this bouncing Betty, you know, whatever that you step on it and you blow up it is so it's terrifying. And it's just left there, you know, to, uh, uh, all over a field for some, you know, poor kid or something to come along and step on. Moving along, Dylan, I have a true crime story that is a little bit mind blowing here, but not out of the realm of uh, possibilities when it comes to crime because we hear stories like this quite a bit but this one just for some reason is very shocking I think because of the amount of money involved. A North Dakota woman has been charged with murder for allegedly fatally poisoning her boyfriend in the hopes of receiving part of his multi-million dollar inheritance. Okay. The Minot Police Department arrested 47-year-old Ina Thea Kenoyer on Monday in connection to the September 5th death of Stephen Edward Riley Jr. He was 51 years old, according to authorities. Kenoyer had financial motives to murder Riley. Prosecutors allege that Kenoyer poisoned her boyfriend with antifreeze because she thought she would receive part of a $30 million inheritance that he was set to receive. Why couldn't she just kick it with him? And I'm sure he would like spend some money on her. Man, that's a terrible, terrible way to kill someone. The affidavit indicated that on September 30, I'm sorry, September 3rd, friends of Riley became concerned when, uh, with his health and they wanted him to see a doctor. He seemed like he was not doing very well, having some issues, but his girlfriend insisted that he was just having a heat stroke. He was eventually taken to the hospital on September 4th after authorities were called and found him unresponsive at the home that he shared with Kenoyer. He died at the hospital the next day. At, uh, autopsy results determined that Riley's cause of death to be poisoning, and they found toxic levels of ethylene glycol, an agent in antifree or antifreeze in his system after his death. His friends told police that Knoyer had made statements about antifreeze before and after his death, according to the affidavit. So police executed a search warrant on Knoyer and Riley's shared residence, where they found a capless Windex bottle containing a bright green liquid in the living room which they suspected to be antifreeze. A glass cup and mug filled with the same liquid, liquid were also found in the garage. 
she didn't even clean it up. And, and, and starts forming those crystals in your body. And, and it's just painful. It's just a terrible way to be poisoned. Poisoning a uh, period is seems so monstrous to me. Like everyone's scrambling around trying to figure out what's wrong with the person. and But you know damn well what it is because you're poisoning them. And a lot of times these people, are they're close to them, obviously, have access. And they're like, oh, I'll take care of them. Don't worry about it. I'll watch after them and just keep poisoning them. According to the news station KX News, when investigators spoke with Kanoyer, she said she knew about the inheritance Riley was set to receive and believed she was entitled to a portion of it, claiming that she was Riley's common-law wife. She added that she had planned on splitting the inheritance with Riley's son now that he was dead. North Dakota does not recognize common-law marriages, and authorities informed Kanoyer that she would not be receiving money, over which she allegedly became upset. She still thought she was going to get it? Kanoyer allegedly eventually admitted to investigators that on September 3rd, she made Riley's sweet tea containing the antifreeze. I mean, that's just horrible. And according to the CDC, the ethylene glycol, which is a key ingredient in antifreeze, has a sweet taste to it, so it could be disguised in a sweet drink. Again, that's very frightening. No, that's why you have to watch uh, dogs will literally drink it, you know, if it's spilled out on the ground or something. You have to be careful with it, the antifreezes. Kenoyer was charged with a Class AA felony murder, which is the most severe kind in the state of North Dakota. I'm going to start a new campaign. Antifreeze only goes in radiators. You know what I mean? Just <laughs> yeah. for like a safety program, a PSA. That's a good idea, Dylan. I mean, we don't really hear a lot about antifreeze murders. No. But on occasion, they pop up. Well, I think the deal is it's uh, very deadly, and it is sweet. You can't mask it. easily accessible. That's the biggest thing. You know, you're not ordering some obscure poison on the internet that's traced or regulated. Yeah, you're just... everyone has antifreeze. Yep. We all need antifreeze. We need for our cars not to freeze. You can just go to the store and buy some. You can get it anywhere. It's true. And next thing you know, you're poisoning somebody with it. It can happen to any of us. Oh, I don't want to think about that. <laughs> I would never poison you, honey. Thank you. You're welcome. So earlier today, we we're recording on Saturday, 10 armed robberies happened within an hour this morning, Saturday, on the south side of Chicago. That seems like a lot. I don't know how many armed robbers, robberies normally happen Well, there. I don't think this many happen in a short period of time, Dylan. That's why it's making headlines. That makes sense. Most of the robberies involved a group of three to four men approaching the victims armed with black handguns and demanding their personal belongings. Uh, belongings. After the victims complied, the suspects fled in a white four-door Toyota or Kia sedan. And then it lists all of the locations where the robberies took place. Now, this began at 6.15 a.m., and carried on until about 7.03 a.m. was the last reported robbery. So not even an hour. Wow. Less than an hour, 10 armed robberies this in is... the southwest Chicago neighborhood. The suspects are described as African-American or Hispanic males wearing black clothing and ski masks with handguns or rifles. No major injuries were reported, but they are asking anyone with information to contact Area 3 Detectives, and that number is 312-744-8263. That's a lot of robberies to happen in a short period of time, and it's very scary. And it is. It seems like we're hearing more and more of these kinds of violent incidences. I, I felt like the getaway car might have been a Nissan Altima, and they had to hurry up and do this before their girlfriend got off work. Oh, because they didn't have to go pick her up. Okay. Yeah. That works. Now, Dylan, this is not a crime story, but one that you'll find impressive. This is a Dylan story. Okay. A group of 55 Germans vacationing in Mallorca, Spain, recently set a new world record for the most number of beers drunk in a period of three hours. 1,254. What? 55 people drank that many beers? Yes. Wow. The bizarre event took place in Playa de Palma, an area known for its active nightlife, but is often criticized as Spain's capital of drunken tourism. <laughs> yeah, there's nothing like drunken tourists to make everybody around them uncomfortable, right? Yes, that's, a, that's especially how I feel about you. 
That is a lot of beers. That's your drunken tourist in my home. For just 55 people. Well, a number of German tourists who didn't know each other beforehand coordinated through the WhatsApp messaging groups and got together at a popular spot with specific goals set by the group of fellow Germans a few months prior. Back in July, another group of German tourists had managed to consume 1,111 beers in three hours. And these folks thought they could do even better. The 55 people reportedly paid a bill of $2,534 for the giant round of beers, but did successfully beat the old record by over 100 beers. Now, those Germans can hold their beer now because they got that old heavy German beer. And they come to other countries and it's like drinking water to them. So that's not, in, what is that? 55 people, that's like 20 beers a piece or something like that. That's a lot of beer. That's a, yeah. In three hours. I would be dead. <laughs> I can't drink 20 beers in three hours. <laughs> no, you can't, can't drink three beers three in, in 20 hours. Or, yeah, it's true. Yeah, that didn't. I can't have three beers in 20 hours. You're absolutely right. No. So Dylan, while many Americans gripe about the loss of sleep after we spring forward with that extra hour of darkness, you know, when we fall back can also be kind of expensive and painful, according to researchers. But crime spikes across the U.S. in the weeks after daylight savings time ends. And citizens turn their clocks back for the fall, according to a new study. Now, the findings were compiled by Vivant, a smartphone company based on FBI data recorded between 2017 and 2021. Not only has the percentage of crimes committed after daylight savings time increased in each of those years, but the total number of crimes has risen as well. So, well, you know, there's a bit, there's a lot of discussion every year when we fall back and we spring forward about not doing it anymore. Some people feel like it's an antiquated thing that we just don't need anymore. And I think some states, maybe even Arizona and possibly Hawaii, have just refused to even acknowledge when it happens and just, you know, keep the right the time that they had before. Oh, I, I don't know. What do you think about it? Do you think it's necessary anymore? Well, it does seem a little useless to me. Yeah. Well, let's continue discussing. Robberies and vehicle thefts had the highest spikes at 64.4%. So that's a lot. Yeah. Respectively, uh, these occur after daylight saving time ends, according to the study. The raw rise of robberies was 81%. Uh, Break-ins were up 16%, although homes protected by security systems uh, see only about a third of the burglaries as those without. Other studies have found that keeping daylight savings time in place all year could reduce crimes, especially robberies. A 2015 Brookings Institution study found that eliminating the fallback could reduce robberies by 27% directly because of the additional daylight in the evenings. Right. Okay. In 2012, researchers Jennifer Doliak and Nicholas Sanders found that robberies, murders, and rapes all decreased at dusk following spring forward. And a 2017 study in the Journal of Experimental Criminology found that assaults rose in big American cities right after daylight saving time ended. So the freaks come out at night, basically, is what I'm hearing from these statistics. The freaks come out at night. So the, the more freaks come out at night, the more activity the public's having in the dark hours, um, the more higher likelihood of um, you know you run in a foul of some criminal. Well, between 2017 and 2021, many types of thefts, including those burglaries, uh, businesses, parked cars, that kind of thing, went up. A retired New York police department sergeant and a professor at John Jay College of Criminal Justice named Joseph Giacalone said, quote, most crimes happen under the cover of darkness. That's why things like broad daylight shootings are so shocking to the public. Most burglaries happen when people leave the house to go to work or school in the morning. And so it's dark out when we set those clocks back. And that could be a reason, too. Yeah, man, when I was working at the mill, I would go to work in the morning. It'd be dark and I'd get off. It would be dark. And it sucks so bad. It just made me depressed. No sunlight in my life. So a few days ago, an Idaho judge granted Brian Koberger's request to access key genetic evidence against him. The former Ph.D. student was indicted on quadruple murder charges for four students after his DNA was linked to a knife sheath at the crime scene. His defense team has questioned how police linked him to the sample, and now they can examine the process. Okay, so they're to find out how they got his DNA to compare to the sample. 
A judge in the Second District Court of Idaho has granted Koberger's attorney's request to examine key genetic evidence tr- tying him to the murders of the four college students. A 32-page order reveals that the judge declined to dismiss the grand jury indictment against Koberger on the murder charges because a few weeks ago they tried to get these charges dismissed. So I wonder if they just followed him around and collected a sample from trash. Uh, you know, they do that a lot. Koberger has been accused of fatally stabbing four Idaho college students in their homes in November of 2022. His team is now seeking specifics from investigators as to how they used investigative genetic genealogy, also called IgG, to connect their client to the murders. This comes after he waived his rights to a speedy trial for the charges. They need to put him to death with nitrous. The decision to grant Koberger's request comes after Judge John Judge. His name is Judge John Judge. No, it's not. Yes. John it's Jacob Jingleheimer Smith. Judge, Judge Judge Jingleheimer, yes. Um, he declined to overturn the charges based on incorrect uh, grand jury instructions. Koberger's team hoped the charges would be voided so he could battle for an insufficient evidence decision in a preliminary hearing. The 32-page order details how Koberger was initially arrested as a suspect in his parents' Pennsylvania home. It further recounted how the prosecutors claimed to the court that they already had sufficient evidence to arrest Koberger for the crime without the DNA samples. The order reads, per the Daily Mail, quote, nothing about law enforcement's use of IgG was was used to obtain the arrest warrant or to obtain the search warrant for his DNA. So basically, if you take that out of the equation, we still have all all the calls and evidence that we need. So it really doesn't matter is what he's saying, yeah? Yeah, and it seems that the prosecutors and defense keep clashing over the evidence. Right. That there seems to be kind of this back and forth. Um, His defense revealed that they're contesting the evidence of his DNA being found on the knife sheath at the crime scene. They claim evidence from three unidentified men were also discovered at the scene. So now maybe we're going to finally see the mental prowess of Mr. Koberger. You know, he's supposed to be this, um, a bit of a true crime forensic prodigy as a student. And and the crime does not reflect that in the least. He left so many tracks, breadcrumbs to be, uh, that led directly back to him. So now maybe, you know, he's just secretly running his own defense through these lawyers. It'll be interesting to see what happens, for sure. Well, we just need justice for those four lives that were snuffed out in the middle of the night for no reason. It just pisses me off when you have a very cocky, arrogant son of a bitch like this Koberger guy, and he's probably guilty. I mean, let's be honest. And then he's going to go try to use all these legal loopholes yeah, and shit to get out of a crime that we know he probably committed. When someone gets off on a technicality, and I do believe everyone deserves a fair trial, a fair impartial trial, um, when they get off on a technicality, even though it seems obvious they're guilty, that's when you got to bring in like a vigilante justice from the dark. You know, like the equalizer needs to come out and kick their ass or something. I mean, if only we had a Denzel like that. Dylan, this will be a story that you'll find interesting. And it's also a crime story. Wow. It's a twofer. Police shut down an alleged psilocybin mushroom factory with eight and a half million dollars worth of psychedelic mushrooms inside a Connecticut man's home Thursday. Now, I saw this headline and I was just like, hold on a second. That's a lot of mushrooms. I've got I've never seen a psilocybin farm. I don't know what kind of yield they get per square foot or any of that, but that is a shit ton of money. Investigators lined up hundreds of white baggied mushrooms in several quadrants along the front yard of the Burlington, Connecticut home. According to some photographs that were provided by the Connecticut State Police, you can find a picture on the people.com website. I'm looking at these bagged mushrooms. It's a lot of damn mushrooms. It's a lot of mushrooms. The bust came from a tip to the DEA. Um, The Hartford Task Force, the Drug Enforcement Administration Hartford Task Force on Thursday morning at the home turned alleged drug factory, Weston Sewell, 21 years old, initially denied that the mushrooms he was growing were illegal per the news outlets. When police asked if they could search the home, 
which had ventilation equipment resembling that used in other drug factories visible from the outside. He turned the detectives away. Police returned later that day with a search warrant uncovering the alleged factory teeming with mushrooms at various growth stages that investigators alleged had a street value of eight and a half million dollars. Yeah, and, and a lot of times they give uh, kind of inflated estimates uh, of the, the street value. They they never they don't take into account bulk buying. You know, it's like everything's broke all the way down to the smallest dealer selling it by the gram, but still. That is a lot of mushrooms. Well, that's when police alleged that Sewell conceded that the mushrooms were, in fact, psilocybin, which is considered a Schedule One controlled substance, and that it is not permitted for legal, I'm sorry, medical use and can easily be abused. So he admitted, yes, you're right. <laughs> These mushrooms are going to have you tripping balls. <laughs> no, they're just portobellas, guys. I really like spaghetti with mushrooms in it. Really. So he was arrested and charged with possession with intent to sell, distribute narcotics and operation of a drug factory, according to WTNH and WFSB News. Sewell, who was held on a $250,000 cash surety bond, was scheduled for arraignment at a New Britain Superior Court Friday. It was not immediately clear how he pleaded to or how he was going to plead or who represented him. So, um, well, your defense has got to be this is all for personal use. <laughs> the seven rooms of mushrooms I was growing. Well, it sounds like someone dialed. These are in. gigantic, not quite garbage bag size, right? But maybe one that you like a liner that you might use in like a bathroom trash can. One of yeah. those small plastic liner full of mushrooms, and there's like hundreds of bags. This is just chaotic. Yeah. Well, somebody dialed his punk ass out, and uh, that's what happens when you're running a drug factory. You can't let anyone know about it. I mean, that's what your best, safest course of action. You think so? Well, you probably shouldn't run a drug factory in the beginning. Hashtag trust no bitch. <laughs> Hashtag trust, trust no bitch. Well, a Louisiana woman was convicted this week of attempted murder after she confessed to her pastor, who is also a major with the Ascension Parish Sheriff's Office. Wow. So she thought she was going to get... Um, Whatever it is, like uh, in the movies, you see somebody confides in a priest, a Catholic priest typically, and uh, they're bound by their vows and all that to not tell on you. But I don't think it works like that. 44-year-old Peggy Valentine was also found guilty of home invasion in connection with the early morning box cutter attack on her fiancé's girlfriend's mother. Prosecutors said Valentine forced her way into the home in the pre-dawn hours of May 4th, 2022, and attacked the woman while she was sleeping. Valentine's attorney, David Bluefield, told people that she went to the home to catch her fiancé in a lie, and that the situation escalated into a tragedy. Now, according to Belfield, the fiancé's girlfriend, whose mother was attacked, recently gave birth to Valentine's fiancé's child. Oh, my gosh. So, again, this is a, a very dysfunctional situation. Yes. I'm a little confused. So it's her fiancé, but the fiancé has a girlfriend slash baby mama. Man, a box cutter. That's a hell of a thing to attack someone with. Just basically a razor with a handle on it, you know? So apparently she did not go over there with the intention to murder or kill anybody, said her attorney. No doors were broken. No locks were tampered with. No windows were broken. None of that. She was just there to try to catch her fiancé in the lie. So after this incident, Valentine reached out to her pastor, the Ascension Parish Sheriff's Office Major, who recommended that she speak to investigators. So she did voluntarily speak to Sheriff's Deputy, but at a certain point, she told him she didn't want to talk to him anymore, and then she demanded once again to talk with the pastor. It was during the talk with the pastor, while another officer was in the room, that she admitted that she went to the home to confront her fiancé and that the situation, quote, got out of hand. Uh, well, I would think so. Someone's dead. Definitely out of hand. Yeah. It's, a, it's like a low rent kind of attack with a box cutter. I mean, honestly. it's That's just vicious. It's a weapon of opportunity, I'm going to assume, typically. No, absolutely. And, and just the uh, brutality of a box cutter. I mean, it's <sighs> sharp, but it's not it, quite a weapon. No. And it's got a little blade. Yeah, and it's going to just, and it's so razor it's, sharp. So it's not going to make deep, deep lacerations. You're slashing people. But it's people. just, that's not going to feel good, bro. No, it's not. And, and 
she claims, obviously, that she was just trying to catch someone in a lie, blah, blah, this and that. This is why you don't do this kind of shit. You just, if that part, if you're, if you're having to go around, sneak around, try to catch someone in a lie, just break up with them. Because if you don't have, if you don't trust them, and they've obviously probably gave, given you reason or cause to not trust them, just break up with them. Who cares if you do catch them with somebody? I mean, it doesn't matter in the, in the big scheme of things. Well, if he's got a baby with another woman, I mean, I think that's a pretty good sign that he's <laughs> cheating on you. Well, my, yeah. So is it really necessary to catch him in a lie? He said it was like a Virgin Mary. He just touched her on her head and she is pregnant. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's just, uh, it's unfortunate. And now she's caught up in this big, huge mess. And uh, who knows what her real intentions were? We don't know. She may have went over there with, you know, full on intentions of attacking someone and harming them. But, but this woman's mother is an innocent yeah, player in all of this. That's what I'm saying. She's like a third party doesn't have a damn thing to do with your relationship. With your dysfunctional engagement, no, and, and then you're going to attack this woman, and that's who. That's how it always goes down. The victim, the victims, always or a lot of times are the innocent not, bystanders. Yeah, are not the people who are actually deserving of punishment, or or not the person who you know they should be retaliating against. I should say, right? I mean, nobody's deserving of it, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah, she should redirect her ire at the real problem here. Which is her dusty ass boyfriend. I was thinking of the word ire as well. Yeah. Yeah. But no, she shouldn't be killing anyone. But um, yeah, if you're going to want to argue and carry on, it should be with uh, the dusty ass boyfriend. Yeah. And again, like you said, just break up with his ass. Just break up. He's toxic. Okay. He's not your fiance and you're not going to marry this person. Some people use the term fiance loosely a lot of times. Yes. You know what I mean? Y'all are just together. I don't think you're really going to get married. There's no date set. You know, they've not really, you not really went through the motions. You just say, it's my fiance. Well, maybe they think it sounds better than boyfriend. This is my boyfriend or my well, girlfriend. Boyfriend and girlfriend sounds this fine. This is my partner. This is my life partner. This is the white puzzle piece to my black puzzle. Yeah. Yeah, we actually heard someone use that phrase the other day. I don't. We know were just that... passing on the sidewalk, and we heard, and we were like, "What the fuck are they even talking about?" What does that mean? Well, yeah, she was talking about like her job. Well, yeah, but I'm saying it, it just was a very weird conversation. And then I heard her say, "Well, you know, it's like the white piece to my black puzzle piece, and it just works." And we were like, "What is?" Is she oh. trying to say the yin and the yang, or the, okay? Well, you got a black puzzle. Well, why the hell would you want a white piece right sticking in the middle of it? Is that a good thing or is it a bad thing? I don't uh, know what she's talking about. I know. About. They, they don't care. It was just a very strange. We were like, what is she even saying? Okay. Who talks like that? <laughs> Who talks like that? <laughs> I think I actually said that. Who talks like that in vague platitudes and buzzwords? Yes. Well, many people. It's very annoying to I me. I can't do it. I hate when I'm having a conversation with somebody and they say a bunch of shit, but you actually don't know what they said. They just threw around a bunch of big vocabulary words and then the buzzwords. Yeah. And, but there's but no, but there's like no substance yeah. to what they actually said. There's no meat in their statement. And I'm like, what do they even say? But they're looking at you like they just said something prolific. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to do it. So, you know, call actually it the Kamala Harris. <laughs> the, yeah. You just got Kamala Harris. You just got <laughs> we have to let go of the transgressions of the past in to order to move, move into the future. future yes. Something like That's that. It's like my favorite quote. Oh my God. That she said. She says that in every, like, every, uh, I wouldn't even call them speeches. Well, Dylan, okay, that's been our midweek episode. A little rusty. Got to get back in the groove of talking true crime news. We do have a listener stories episode. Oh, yay. Coming up. Um, we're going to be dropping that very soon to give our listeners a little extra bonus since we have been a bit late with some of our episodes. And then we have our regular true crime episode this week. Gonna go ahead and let you know, it's a two-parter. It's it, gonna be a banger. It's gonna be a banger. Heather has been working her little tail off on this. So much information. You know, if Heather breaks it up into a two-parter, there's just a ton to talk about, and it's a it's a it's a it's well known a big case. Yes, one that I'm not super familiar with, so I learned a lot in my research. Fascinating stuff, Dylan. It's going to be such a great discussion, and we can't wait to get into it. And we're going to work on it right now. So we hope this episode finds everyone safe and secure. And warm. And warm and happy. And uh, we will catch you next time. Yeah, bye. Bye.